Hello, everyone. My name is Remis Owens, and we are pleased that you could all join us for this week's lecture in volume seven of our The No Neuropsychology Didactic Series that brings you lectures from experts in the field covering different topics each week. And this series was created by trainees and early career neuropsychologists, including standing members of the No Neuropsychology Board as well as members of the No Neuropsychology Committee. And we are also excited to welcome our new 2023 to 2025 committee members whose pictures are shown here. We would like to thank our 2023 sponsors for their generous financial support of the series. And additionally, we are grateful to our AACN colleagues for their sponsorship, we wanted to share information about the upcoming AACN 2023 Hybrid Conference in Washington, D.C. Even if you don't attend in person, all registrants get access to conference talks online for two months after the event. Registration ends May 31st. And before we start our lecture, one of the main goals of No Neuropsychology is to provide free, high-quality didactic content to our audience. Every No Neuropsychology and No Neuroanatomy lecture is available on our YouTube channel. So be sure to check it out, subscribe, and like our lectures to get first access to new content. New to Neuropsychology is our collaboration with Appson to bring you learning and discussion questions that are provided with specific lecture content. You can access these on our website and through Appson. And here are the disclaimers for the series. This training is not meant to replace formal education and neuropsychology and the views of the speakers are their own. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A box on the lower left of your screen and a recording of today's lecture will be provided on our website and YouTube channel later this week. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brianna Almond for today's lecture titled Hearing and Dementia. Dr. Almond is a clinical neuropsychologist and the manager of the Neuropsychology Center at the Banner Sun Health Research Institute, located outside of Phoenix, Arizona. She earned her doctorate of psychology from Yeshiva University in New York and completed a two-year postdoctoral fellowship in the Department of Neurology at the University of Virginia Health System. During fellowship, Dr. Allman began specializing in aging and neurodegenerative disease disorders, which led her to Banner Sun Health Research Institute in September of 2018, and also prompted her interest in hearing loss. Currently, Dr. Allman sees patients for comprehensive evaluations in the outpatient clinic and provides supervision for both pre-doctoral graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. Dr. Allman, thank you so much and welcome, and we look forward to your lecture. Well, thank you for inviting me and for that introduction. I will switch over to my slides now. Um, so yes, we wanted to talk about hearing loss and dementia and how are the two really related. So what I'd like to cover today is a little bit of background about anatomy and neuroanatomy. I know that's always interesting to everybody. A little bit of a refresher about dementia. Um, what does it really mean? How is it really diagnosed? And then connect the two and find out how hearing loss is actually a modifiable risk factor for dementia. There's several proposed mechanisms that connect these two things. So we'll really dive into that and then close out with some recommendations. So first some definitions. Um, there's different types of hearing loss. Conductive hearing loss takes place in the outer or middle ear and that's where the sound waves are not able to carry all the way through to the inner ear that even has those receptive cells. So this is when sound could be blocked by a foreign object or earwax. Um, in the middle ear, there could be an impaction with fluid or an infection or something like that. So these tend to be more common in children, although I will say that older adults also experience conductive hearing loss, especially as that earwax uh, loses moisture and is stickier. Sensory neural hearing loss takes place in the inner ear or when the actual nerve is damaged. 
This generally occurs when the hair cells in the cochlea are damaged and not able to then convert those mechanical sound waves into electrical impulses. This is the most common type of hearing loss and what we'll focus on today. And then mixed hearing loss, there can be a combination of these two things. Typically people with a sensory neural hearing loss also then develop a conductive component on top of it. So this is also known as age-related hearing loss. Generally, the most common cause of that is that sensory neural hearing loss. It's gradual, um, typically bilateral, equally occurring in both ears. And it could be due to a combination of factors. As we get older, the hair cells in our hearing, in our ears start to degenerate. Um, typically, the cells that allow you to hear higher pitch frequencies degenerate sooner. And the cochlea is particularly susceptible to this kind of damage because those inner ear cells do not have the capacity to regenerate. Also, sometimes just loud or prolonged sounds damage the hair cells. Certain medical conditions, medications can also impact these and like everything has a genetic risk as well. Of course, there's other types such as congenital hearing loss at birth or otosclerosis, which is a disease of the ear bones, but this presentation will focus on age-related hearing loss and when I refer to hearing loss, I'm always referring to this type. So a little bit about how does hearing work in the first place? Hearing depends on a series of events that convert sound waves in the air into electrical signals. The auditory nerve then carries these signals to your brain through a complex series of steps. Sound waves travel through a narrow passageway, the ear canal, and lead to the eardrum which then vibrates and sends these vibrations to those three tiny bones in the middle ear. These bones couple the sound vibrations from the air to fluid, which is located in the cochlea. It's shaped like a snail. An elastic partition runs from the beginning to the end of the cochlea, splitting into an upper and a lower part. That's called the basilar membrane because it serves as the base or ground floor on which the hearing structures sit. Once the vibrations cause the fluid inside the cochlea to ripple, this travels along the basilar membrane and moves mechanical hair cells sitting on top of it. As the hair cells move up and down, little projections on the tip of each hair cell, known as the stereocilia, bump against an overlying structure, the tectorial membrane, and bend. This bending mechanically opens and closes potassium channels, um, moving mechanical energy into chemical energy, resulting in that electrical signal for activation or deactivation of the cell. And then after all this, the auditory nerve carries this signal to the brain. 90% of our auditory nerve fibers receive their input from those inner hair cells located close to the oval window. Those ones are shorter and stiffer and respond to higher frequencies. Unfortunately, these higher frequencies are the ones that tend to be lost with age as well. Getting into the brain, electrical impulses travel along the auditory nerve, which by the way is cranial nerve eight, shares with the vestibular nerve as well, and pass through several information processing centers. As you can see here, there are several points of crossing, although the majority of sound is thought to travel contralaterally. Really, it's bilateral because there's so much sharing. The comparison and analysis of differences in left ear and right ear actually provides really important information regarding location and understanding of sounds, kind of placing them in the environment. Once inside the brain, information is processed centrally by several important auditory nuclei. So the auditory nerve synapses with the cochlear nucleus, which has a dorsal and a ventral aspect. Fibers of the ventral cochlear nucleus synapse at the superior olivary nucleus of the pons. This appears to function in localizing sounds horizontally in space. On the dorsal side, the dorsal cochlear nucleus ascends bilaterally along the lateral lemniscus through the brainstem, pons, and lower midbrain up to the inferior colliculus. Here and then farther along this pathway are combination sensitive neurons that enhance the processing of specific sounds, particularly speech and communication in humans. From here, fibers ascend to the medial geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, which we know is the relay center. And information 
follows the auditory radiations, which are fiber pathways within the internal capsule up to the primary auditory cortex. So as you can see in this representation, also note that there are several descending circuits that modulate our auditory attention based on salience of the information. Something interesting to note is that the cochlea is what's called tonotopically organized, such that different sound frequencies are processed by different parts along the coil, with high-pitched sounds being sensed at the base and low-pitched low sounds in the apex at the tip. This map actually carries all the way through the auditory nuclei up to the primary auditory cortex, which also maintains this tonotopic organization much like how somatosensory areas reflect a homunculus of sensation. The auditory cortex is on Heschel's gyrus, which is inside the lateral sulcus or sylvian fissure, just medial to the superior temporal gyrus. The nearby areas include temporal and parietal lobes and the secondary auditory association cortex, which of course includes Wernicke's area and the associated receptive language functions. So I think when we're thinking about hearing loss and dementia, it's important to keep in mind the really close proximity of auditory processing centers to those key structures important for memory and language. Coming back to the real world, the common symptoms of age-related hearing loss are others can sound mumbled. Um, sometimes spouses get accused of mumbling or speaking too quietly. Also high-pitched sounds such as or th are harder to distinguish. This is really problematic because those are also the consonant sounds that differentiate words. So it can feel like people are talking and not making sense. Background noise is a really significant problem. Typically lower pitches like men's voices are easier to hear. On the flip side, there can also be tinnitus ringing in the ears or overreaction to loud or annoying sounds. The prevalence of hearing loss is great. It's very common as we age. Over one third of those over 65 have some hearing loss. And by the time we reach 70, over two thirds of the population has some hearing loss. The rate of this is predicted to double over the next 40 years. And men are about twice as likely as women to experience hearing loss. Even though it is so common, or maybe because it's so common, hearing loss often goes untreated. Adults age 70 and older with hearing loss who could benefit from hearing aids, fewer than one in three of them have ever used them. And this is even lower as we get into lower age ranges. Another very common issue as we age is dementia and cognitive impairment in general. Currently, there's more than 55 million people living in the world with dementia, and there are nearly 10 million new cases every year. So the scope of these two problems combined is quite large. There's many risk factors that can increase one's risk of dementia, but by far the greatest known risk factor is just increasing age. The prevalence of dementia among older adults increases with age, ranging from 2% in the 60 to 65 year old range, all the way up to 33% or one third of the population in our 90s. Regarding Alzheimer's disease specifically, after age 65, the risk of Alzheimer's doubles every five years, with the risk reaching nearly one third by 85. I also wanted to clarify some definitions related to dementia. Dementia is what we call an umbrella term. It refers to a group of symptoms, including memory loss and other problems in thinking beyond the effects of normal aging and at the level that they interfere with daily functioning. Dementia can result from a variety of different diseases and injuries that affect the brain, like Alzheimer's disease or stroke. Types of dementia are defined by their presumed cause of cellular death. So this could be the buildup of certain proteins or a direct injury, such as a traumatic brain injury. So as you can see here, Alzheimer's disease is just one type of dementia and one cause, but it is the most common, accounting for 60 to 80%. Getting into it a little bit further, historically dementia has been diagnosed based on the clinical presentation. But more recently, there's been increasing incorporation of biomarkers, such as patterns of atrophy on neuroimaging like an MRI. 
and even more advanced imaging and diagnostic techniques like CSF analysis. In terms of neurodegenerative causes of dementia, which account for most cases of dementia, diagnostic thinking has shifted to include the underlying pathological brain changes. So pretty much all neurodegenerative dementias can be described as a proteinopathy, meaning that they're caused by misfolded proteins that then set off a cascade of inflammation and neuronal injury eventually resulting in the cognitive and behavioral symptoms that make up that clinical presentation. Commonly, we think of Alzheimer's disease as being related to amyloid, Parkinson's disease and related disorders as being related to alpha-synuclein, and frontotemporal lobar degeneration or any FTD syndrome as related to a tauopathy. However, even more recently, it's become clear that the same protein can result in different clinical presentations and the same clinical presentation can be due to multiple different underlying proteinopathies. In fact, it's becoming more and more clear that comorbidity is actually the rule rather than the exception, particularly as we increase in age. These additional contribution from vascular disease also greatly increases. Um, this really complicates our job as neuropsychologists, but I mention it here because it also complicates understanding the literature regarding the mechanism of dementia risk factors. Some risk factors we can't change, like genetics. However, there are many modifiable risk factors that can increase or decrease risk of developing dementia. A 2020 Lancet Commission on Dementia, you've probably seen this image many times before, <laughs> described a life course model identifying potentially modifiable risk factors for dementia many of which relate to increasing brain health or cognitive reserve. Hearing loss was actually defined as the single largest potentially modifiable risk factor for dementia, accounting for 8% of lifetime risk, higher than smoking, depression, and even brain injury. Put another way, addressing hearing loss has the potential to reduce the number of dementia cases by 8%. Using those US numbers from the previous slide, that would be over 700,000 individuals. In fact, it's been found that there's a linear relationship such that the risk of dementia increases with the severity of hearing loss. In a landmark 2011 study, Franklin and colleagues at Johns Hopkins found that compared to individuals with normal hearing, those with mild hearing loss had a twofold risk, while moderate and severe hearing loss conferred a three and fivefold risk of developing dementia over 10 years. This pattern has since held in other large prospective cohort studies and in a recent nationally representative study of Medicare beneficiaries. For every 10 decibels of hearing loss, dementia risk increased by 14%, and the risk was greatest in those with moderate to severe hearing loss. This also occurs at subclinical levels. Hearing loss has been associated with general cognitive impairment, not necessarily tied to a diagnosis. A 2018 meta-analysis showed that hearing loss was associated with decline in all these cognitive domains, particularly executive functioning and episodic memory. Even at lower levels, hearing loss links to cognition. A study from 2020 found that for every 10 decibel decrease in hearing, scores on cognitive tests of thinking and attention speed decreased by about three points. So very subtle, but the link really held. The same pattern was found for tests of verbal fluency, verbal memory and learning, and global cognitive function. And this association remained despite controlling for confounding factors like age, sex, education level, cardiovascular disease, and even hearing aid use. So this link has been, at this point, pretty well established. The question, though, remains, is it a causal relationship? Uh, and if so, what is that mechanism by which hearing loss causes or maybe contributes to dementia? Several different hypotheses have been proposed. Maybe hearing loss is, and dementia are both caused by some common shared process. Or does hearing loss increase other factors that increase risk of dementia? Some have proposed that the reduced activation of those auditory nerves causes changes in brain structure and function, or maybe it relates to the use of brain resources. It's also possible, and I think very likely, 
that more than one of these mechanisms could be true and the proportional contribution could really vary for each individual, much like those mixed causes of dementia. So I don't think these are mutually exclusive. Interest into trying to define this mechanism has really grown in recent years. However, the current state of the literature is really complicated by heterogeneity and a few different important factors. So these are some basically questions to ask whenever reviewing any publications related to this question. First of all, how is hearing measured? Audiometry reflects the ability to detect pure tones, which does not depend on higher order cortical processing and can be reliably performed in people with dementia. Other types of hearing assessment like speech and noise or dichotic listening tests better reflect real world hearing function, but they're also impacted by cortical functioning. Audiometry might be better placed to clarify the mechanisms as it doesn't rely on that cognitive processing, but those more complex hearing tests could reflect some of those shared processes and again are better suited for real world, maybe rather than research. Even less reliably, some studies just use a diagnosis of hearing loss or self-report of hearing abilities to define their hearing impaired sample. So this could result in significant differences in their findings. We also have to consider how cognition is measured. And if the study is looking at dementia risk specifically or cognitive functioning, sometimes in cognitively intact individuals. When the outcome is dementia, we want to consider how is that diagnosis established. Sometimes it's just a historical report or a clinical judgment. And rarely is the specific subtype or etiology confirmed through biomarkers. So at this point, we're pretty much always looking at kind of all cause dementia. Similarly, cognitive status is often based upon short screening measures, but there are a few studies that look at comprehensive neuropsychological assessment and then allow us to look into differences between different domains of cognitive functioning. Finally, what is the proposed mechanism of of interest that they're looking at. This can usually be divided into neural um, or behavioral mechanisms. When the focus is neural mechanisms, the use of structural versus functional imaging may speak to very different processes and uh, different mechanisms. So keep these in mind as we're reviewing some of the literature later. Going back to our hypotheses, the first one is a common cause hypothesis. This postulates that hearing loss and cognitive decline are the result of some shared underlying process, often neurodegenerative in nature. So diseases like vascular disease and Alzheimer's disease affect brain structures, of course, but they've also been found in the ear structures as well. In, partic in particular, the cochlea is very susceptible to vascular damage. Other biological processes like inflammation and oxidative stress that can be, you know, really general affecting our whole system can also damage both ear and brain cells. So it could be some shared process. Likewise, measures of central auditory processing. So some of those more complex hearing tests, they might actually be a biomarker for some cortical process. Um, not really measuring pure hearing itself, but the impact of cognitive change on hearing. There is some evidence in this area, but the results are mixed. Levels of beta amyloid deposition and tau burden have been correlated with levels of hearing loss. Another study found support for a potential reverse causation pathway as an AD genetic risk factor. So certainly something that has to occur first predicted later probability of hearing difficulty. However, many other studies, including meta-analyses show a relationship between hearing loss and dementia that persists after correction for things like vascular disease and many of these other proposed shared factors. So there seems to be something more there than just reflecting the same underlying process. Another potential mechanism is comorbidity with other behavioral changes. Each of these independently increases dementia risk, including social isolation in particular. A recent systematic review found that hearing loss was consistently associated with social isolation, 
And as you can see, that was also identified by the Lancet Commission as one of those modifiable risk factors. Audiologists will sometimes describe a cascading cycle of depression, resulting from the person with hearing loss finding it difficult to communicate, leading to decreased participation in social activities, and then decreased participation in those enjoyable activities, resulting in depression and stress, anxiety, and low self-esteem. So this, of course, depression is also an independent risk factor for dementia. It's also likely that these things work together. So many studies of hearing loss and dementia control for these factors, but they probably have a bi-directional relationship. And all of these health behaviors and psychological factors can impact physiological processes like HPA access reactivity, immune responses, and inflammation. Getting down to the neural level, there is the auditory deprivation hypothesis, which states that hearing loss creates an impoverished environment. So lack of sound, understandable sound coming in, leads to decreased activation of these auditory processing pathways, particularly related to speech and language. Eventually, this leads to deafferentation and atrophy of these areas. This change in brain structure and function is then, of course, itself a risk factor for development of dementia. Much of the research in this area comes from structural imaging. When looking at specific brain regions, typically frontotemporal patterns have been the most commonly identified. Regional volume loss in those specific areas, rather than global atrophy, seems to provide support for this deprivation hypothesis rather than some common cause, which would likely be more widespread. It's logical to extrapolate that this decreased activation and the associated atrophy could affect cognitive abilities and increase risk for dementia. But for now, research in this area primarily focuses on cognitive dysfunction rather than dementia diagnosis per se. And this hypothesis could also interact with the depression and social isolation that we just described with both direct and then indirect effects on cognition. One hypothesis that has really received a lot of attention is the idea of cognitive load. Cognitive resources naturally diminish with aging. Poor hearing then makes it difficult to pick up those speech sounds and makes them distorted, which requires more mental resources to decode them, leaving fewer resources available for the task at hand. Many people with hearing loss feel like they can understand others just fine. And this can actually be true. Studies have shown that high speech intelligibility can be achieved when speech is degraded due to mild or moderate hearing loss. However, only at the cost of increased effort and fatigue through increased use of executive function and working memory. This hypothesis suggests that Increased brain activity needed for speech analysis competes with those very same networks that are needed for memory and other aspects of thinking. Those degraded auditory signals are overly processed in an attempt to decode them. This leads to compensatory recruitment of additional resources and networks that aren't usually involved in speech comprehension. Over time, this results in dysregulation and excessive glutamate activity eventually resulting in maladaptive cross-modal reorganization and actual remodeling of the system. Studies in this area usually relate more to functional imaging, typically highlighting greater engagement of frontal networks and cognitive control subcortical networks. Likewise, kind of taking this one step further, some researchers have considered that either the decreased brain activity or the increased maladaptive activity associated with hearing loss could induce neuropathological cellular changes. For now, the evidence is only correlational based on the co-occurrence of both altered neuronal activity due to hearing loss and Alzheimer's disease pathology in the temporal lobes and hippocampus. So they've been connected, they increase together, but um, it's unclear what direction that relationship goes. Finally, as we noted earlier, it's really likely that these proposed processes co-occur. 
Potentially, this could even result in kind of a synergistic amplification of their effects. For example, the same cognitive control networks that are impacted by hearing loss and depression are also impacted by depression, so they could exacerbate each other's negative effects. The cumulative result of all of these risk factors is reduced resilience. The constant cognitive load reduces functional cognitive reserve and allows clinical symptoms to manifest earlier. At the same time, atrophy and dysregulated networks can impact structural brain reserve and confer an increased vulnerability to dementia neuropathology of any type, basically creating a much more vulnerable brain. We're also finding out that the relevance of each one of these different mechanisms and the strength of their relationship could vary. So for each individual, you could have a specific kind of risk factor score. For example, different patterns of associations have been observed in different age groups. Even within older adults, cognitive decline associated with hearing loss was more widespread in an older, oldest old age group. In the younger old group, hearing loss was associated with the presence of amyloid, supporting maybe the common cause hypothesis whereas this association was not seen in the older old age group. Instead, hearing loss was associated with atrophy, which aligns more with the sensory deprivation hypothesis. Findings have also varied in different cognitive statuses. So opposite patterns of activation were observed in MCI versus a cognitively intact group. These findings support the role of cognitive load and that long-term degeneration of the auditory cortex especially in a population with lower cognitive reserves, such as an MCI group. So the, the big question I think that remains is, is cognitive decline related to hearing loss reversible? Several of these hypotheses suggest that it could be. By restoring the appropriate stimulation, reducing cognitive burden, and reducing behavioral risk factors like isolation. This idea has received some support. So in 2016, researchers saw significant improvement in cognitive test performance with hearing aid use. And then this performance actually returned back down to baseline when hearing aids stopped being used. In addition, an observational study of a nationwide data found that hearing aid use was associated with a 32% lower prevalence of dementia. Functional and structural neural changes have also been observed with reversed cross-modal reorganization and increased cortical thickness in those integration areas that are so key and reflect optimal normal cognitive functioning. However, all these observational studies are prone to confounding by all the other factors like healthcare access, SES, things that affect both hearing aid use and dementia prevalence. And other questions remain as most studies focus on cognitively intact participants. So we don't know the effect on those with pre-existing cognitive impairment, which is often when we may be seeing people. There might be a limited window of opportunity, as one study found that hearing aid use was associated with a lower risk of dementia in an MCI population, so lower risk of conversion. But hearing aid use among those with dementia was not associated with any improvement on clinical dementia rating scale. Hearing aids can help more than just cognition. They can also address other possible mechanisms and then reduce those dementia risk factors. One study found that using hearing aids for 30 days reduced the risk of falls. Of course, this makes sense because our ears and hearing are linked to our vestibular system, maintaining balance and using those sound cues to maintain spatial orientation. Treatment of hearing loss also restores the ability for normal social engagement. So smaller studies have found decreases in depression and loneliness, as well as improvements in perceptions of general health and even caregiver burden. So there's good reason to be hopeful that the treatment of hearing loss can restore cognitive function and reduce the risk of dementia. But for now, there have not been any large studies that can really speak to causation. But right now, researchers at Johns Hopkins are conducting a randomized controlled trial to investigate whether hearing treatment can reduce cognitive decline in older adults 
It's known as the ACHIEVE trial, and the three-year follow-up period is actually wrapping up really soon. So we should be hearing about that. And I think everybody who's interested in this topic is anxiously awaiting it. So we know that hearing loss is bad for the brain and that treatment of hearing loss might improve cognition and reduce the risk of dementia. But we also know that most people who have the hearing loss do not have hearing aids or have them and don't wear them. Only 14% of older adults with hearing loss use hearing aids. So why is that? This question has actually been investigated empirically. A recent systematic review found that financial concerns, stigma, inconvenience, other health problems that were perceived as more important and unrealistic expectations were the primary barriers to treatment. But regarding that first one, which I think is a big one, it's the one that's always cited to me by my patients, there is some good news. There's been recent progress to address the financial and access barriers to hearing treatment. Last August, the FDA passed a final ruling that established a new category of over-the-counter hearing aids enabling people with perceived mild to moderate hearing impairment to purchase hearing aids directly from stores or online retailers without needing any medical exam, prescription, or fitting by an audiologist. In addition, the 2022 update of the National Plan to Address Alzheimer's Disease also calls for increased access to hearing aids, reducing this financial burden in order to promote brain health. I think this is good news overall, but when we're advising our patients, we can really think about this kind of like buying reading glasses at the store. Um, there's no evaluation, but you can try on a few pairs and find out what's helpful, and it could result in greater overall use of hearing aids and possibly reducing that worldwide risk of dementia. Um, but they are technically only indicated for those with mild hearing loss. And anybody with more significant problems, it may be worth getting checked out by an audiologist as well. I also recommend sometimes a combination approach, which is to first get the evaluation by a professional. Um, that part is often covered by insurance. And then use that information to inform maybe your off-the-market purchase. So while the specific causal links are still being investigated, for now, it's pretty clear that we have enough information to inform our, our clinical practice. First, we have to be sure to reduce the potential impact of hearing loss on neuropsychological testing as much as possible. If it is known or even suspected that your patient has hearing loss that could interfere with accurate perception of stimuli or understanding of test instructions, it's important to reduce that confounding factor as much as possible. Otherwise, your results um, really could lead you astray. First, we can use accommodations like one of these personal sound amplifiers pictured here. That increases volume without making us strain our voice during the testing session, which also tends to make it higher and even harder to perceive anyway. If hearing loss is significant, maybe accommodations are not enough. You might also consider modifying standardized administration to provide both auditory and visual instructions and even stimuli. Patients are sometimes unaware of their hearing difficulty, so you could also consider screening for speech understanding. Protocols are being developed that simply involve repetition of sentences. And I know that at our institute, we've used a repetition of a simple sentence to ensure understanding of speech over the phone. After testing is completed and we're giving feedback and recommendations to our patients, I often recommend hearing screening or a comprehensive hearing evaluation to anyone with even minimally suspected hearing loss. Hearing loss can have all those negative impacts that we discussed and more simply just interferes with communication and relationships. I can't even count how many times um, I've heard complaints about perhaps a spouse talking from the other room and then they can't understand them and it results in a lot of frustration. I also recommend updating adjustment of hearing aid settings if they've not been checked in a while. So I always ask first if someone has hearing problems, how they think their hearing is, if they have hearing aids, if they wear them, and also if they feel like they're working well, because if not, 
it may be time to get the settings rechecked. If they're not as effective, um, they may not be achieving those benefits that we think they should. To support this recommendation, it's always important to provide psychoeducation, basically about all the information we just talked about in an approachable way. Most people are unaware of the cognitive and functional risks associated with hearing loss. And sharing what we know about that impact on cognitive resources can be a really important motivator. And I have found it to be a really effective conversation uh, and a really simple thing that patients can try to address. For those who already have hearing aids but don't wear them consistently, which we know is really common, neuropsychologists also have a role in supporting better adherence. We can offer compensatory strategies to help folks remember to put in their hearing aids and education about their role in wearing them even at quiet settings like at home. There's also important education to offer about adjusting to hearing aids for new users or those who never really fully adapted to them. Like any other prosthetic device, it takes time and consistency for a brain to adjust to the new input. Sounds might be especially loud or bothersome in the beginning, but over time, the brain will adjust to the new input and be able to use it effectively. So like anything new, I recommend sticking with it for a few weeks before giving up or requesting any adjustments. Sometimes patients feel like their hearing aids are too loud, so they ask to have them turned down, um, but then at that point, they're not really working, achieving as they should. Like everything else, it always it comes back to prevention. Preventing hearing loss is one way to reduce dementia risk. <clears throat> and many of these behaviors are modifiable risk factors for both hearing and overall brain health. So this includes things like managing vascular risk factors, no smoking, limit alcohol, getting good nutrition, including certain vitamins that are important for hearing, and exercising and controlling stress to reduce that inflammation. Finally, it's worth pointing out that hearing loss was identified as a major modifiable risk factor for later developing dementia at midlife. So much like physical fitness, many hearing experts recommend the idea of hearing fitness or keeping your hearing in shape before it's too late. Any noise over 85 decibels can cause hearing loss which is roughly equivalent to just standing in city traffic or pushing a lawnmower. So I think the most important point from this talk is to take care of your hearing now to protect your brain and reduce your risk of dementia in the future. And if you or someone you love has hearing loss, wear those hearing aids in order to reap all the great benefits that they most likely offer. And with that, I will stop sharing and I'm open to taking some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Alman. What a wonderful um, talk that you gave on hearing and dementia. I learned so much and I know our audience did as well. So thank you again. And audience, feel free. Um, you all can um, start placing any questions that you have in the Q&A. Um, we have some time. and. And I'll go through those questions and ask Dr. Almond these wonderful questions that you all have. So Dr. Almond, we do have a question um, and it's in relation to um, the slide where you were mentioning the different accommodations that we should have um, for our clinical practice. And so there's a question, um, particularly in related to your accommodations, you mentioned an amplifier. Um, is there a specific one that you use that also may be pretty affordable for different practices or you have a, a, a variety of different ones you like? There's, they're pretty easily available on Amazon now, but the most common brand name people might know of is the Pocket Talker. <laughs> and basically the way it works is it looks like a old fashioned um, cassette player, if anybody remembers those, <laughs> and has a headset. So the patients can wear it and adjust, the volume is also adjustable so that it can stay comfortable for them. Um, in case it ever comes up kind of outside of hearing loss, we've also worn the headset when patients have really bad hypophonia or soft speech too. So they come in pretty handy. That's really nice. That's nice to have on handy too. Makes testing um, a lot better. Nice. We, when we think a patient might need them, we really uh, offer it more as a recommendation than a question. 
Absolutely. Yeah, good. And are there any other specific recommendations um, that maybe you would have for patients with hearing loss and dementia that maybe when you're um, in your feedback sessions that you've noticed are kind of specific to this population um, that kind of really stands out to you? Absolutely. And some of them are obvious, but that doesn't mean people always do them. So anything that can enhance communication. So sitting face to face across from each other, turn off distractions. Um, thank goodness there's less mask wearing needed now. Being able to read lips is really, really important. Um, and basically providing, uh, what is the word? Straightforward information. So for patients with dementia, it's much easier to understand, stay here, then don't go over there. Okay. Um, so kind of keeping things simple is often our recommendation and making sure that they can hear you and are attending in the first place. Okay. I think that's another thing spouses get accused of is uh, talking while you're on the other side of the room, just kind of in passing. <laughs> Exactly. And I can imagine that um, it's a lot of training for the caregiver as well, too, um, of really um, when you're caring for um, this loved one of having to kind of make some alterations too for themselves because of that hearing loss aspect. Absolutely. Something else we have to remind caregivers, especially if their loved one also has dementia and hearing loss, is um, to find out if the hearing aids are working because your person with dementia may not notice and may not express that. Um, so keeping an eye on if someone's not responding to you, it could mean that their hearing aids just died, not that they've had some big change in attention or alertness or anything like that. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, we have another question. Um, and it's, it's a really interesting question. It um, relates to kind of if there is, um, if you're seeing executive um, difficulties in um, someone that has dementia, um, what does that adjustment and kind of training to the hearing aid look like, as well as kind of those beginning stages of like um, extra recommendations, um, strategies that they may need because of those executive difficulties? Absolutely. Being able to use a hearing aid requires some degree of those executive difficulties. They're really small. Sometimes they have different parts and they require cleaning and um, recharging and lots of little specifics that we may not think about. So I think that's where we have a role in coming up with some compensatory strategies to make sure that they can remember to get these things done, some of that prospective memory, mm -hmm. and maybe using reminders. Um, I find that patients are still able to use technology. Everyone has adapted really well, I think. And many hearing aids actually link to cell phones. So you can adjust some of the settings there and use them when you're on the phone through Bluetooth. So that requires a really high level of executive function too. So I think depending on severity, there may be a role for a caregiver or if it's at milder stages, just getting everything written down and being able to follow the process step by step. And like everything, we kind of recommend practicing things now while your brain is working pretty well so that if there's later decline, it's kind of already automatic. Yeah, that's a, that's a really helpful when you're kind of introducing these compensatory strategies, starting that off early. So then it is kind of in process and that, that is helpful um, when, you, when you've kind of trained yourself and mm -hmm. that's a lot easier, yeah. And I suspect that people with any level of cognitive dysfunction may take even longer to adapt to the hearing aid. It takes um, anyone with intact cognition a few weeks anyway, so it, it may take the brain even longer. So I think kind of sticking with it and staying in touch with the provider is really important. And would you say that um, within this field, specifically with hearing loss and dementia, do you feel as though it's really interdisciplinary with other providers? Do you find yourself really in contact with other providers in relation to um, the cognition as well as maybe the adherence? Absolutely. Well, going back, I can tell you a little bit about how I got in interested in this in the first place, which is that a local otolaryngologist, neuro-otolaryngologist, so basically someone who specializes in just the, 
just the, he says he's just the E part of ENT, just ears, um, and also neurology training. So he does surgeries such as cochlear implant. And he was finding that some of his cochlear implant patients who are older weren't adapting, they weren't benefiting from the cochlear implant as much as expected. And we started to realize that could be because they had pre-existing cognitive impairment. So we um, kind of formed that collaboration when he reached out to our institute and looked into how can we develop a battery for testing someone with really severe hearing impairment. So in this case, these people using a personal sound amplifier wouldn't help. They have really, really severe levels, almost no hearing. So we had to modify things. Everything is kind of off script. All the norms are a little bit out the window, but <laughs> um, did we did want to find a way to at least intuitively kind of rule out any significant cognitive impairment that would get in the way of adapting to this because it's a brain surgery too. So, um, so that's what got me interested in it. And yes, I think interdisciplinary is really important. I would actually love to establish even closer relationships with audiologists because I suspect they probably struggle with follow-up and adherence in ways that neuropsychologists could help. And at the same time, just getting my patients to get hearing aids first before they have testing <laughs> is really helpful. Yes. Yeah, that is, I'm sure that is really helpful and needed as well too, because the um, accommodations and um, the adjustments that you make are helpful, but to also have that hearing aid as well too would probably be the primary um, accommodation that would be needed. Absolutely, that's gonna get you the closest to normal hearing functioning. And I appreciate the resources that you mentioned as well too, because I think that's really helpful for all of us to be able to share with the patients that we're coming in contact with too. Mm -hmm. And then what about um, non-age related hearing loss? So for example, like in childhood, um, if a child has deafness um, or any hearing loss earlier in life, um, have you found that they may have a higher risk for developing dementia? Is there any Thing like that or research going on now? I'm sure there is. I haven't focused on it, but the few times when it's been mentioned kind of in this same context, there's reason to believe that there wouldn't be the same kind of risk because their brains have already pre-existingly adapted to not having that auditory input. Um, so it wouldn't be using up those cognitive networks in the same way or taking up those resources. So the tiny bit that I have read is I think um, that population may be a little, a little safer in some ways. Yeah. Wow, our brains are very interesting and the plasticity is wonderful in the brains at appropriate times, so. Wow. Well, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful time um, that you have shared all this information with us, so thank you. Um, and so would you say, also we have another question, would you say that intact hearing is protective for development of dementia? Is there any, uh, anything that you're seeing in relation to that? I would say yes, because it's eliminating one risk factor. Mm. Just like um, having good blood pressure control or getting exercise. Yeah, and that was um, the list that you provided too of all of the different risk factors that you mentioned as well too, and the, the comorbidities as well. Have you seen any, um, changes and risk when you have that comorbidity as well too? Does that really increase that risk? That's one possible theory is that these things might actually compound each other. So if we imagine our typical patient in the dementia clinic, they likely have so many of those modifiable risk factors. Um, and the way I talk about it with patients is these are all opportunities to adjust your risk. So sometimes the recommendations list can get a little long depending on how many of those boxes somebody's checking, but that also gives them more um, opportunities for improvement too. And I usually will advise people to start with, well, one, the one that you think will give you the most kind of bang for your buck in terms of your time and energy or, and or whichever you'll actually do first. <laughs> um, trying to keep it really practical because I know those feedback sessions can feel like, whoa, this is a lot of stuff that I need to work on. Yeah. Um, so one thing at a time. Yeah, I'm sure it can be really overwhelming for the patient and the caregiver as well too. 
who is really assisting and helping and ensuring that everything is squared away for modifying. Yeah. And I was wondering, could you speak about the correlation of tinnitus and dementia risk um, in that cognitive impairment? Absolutely. So I think that's another area of research that's getting looked into. Um, it does appear that tinnitus is a risk factor for dementia, probably through a lot of those same mechanisms as hearing loss, except when we're thinking about, you know, lack of activation, it might actually be the opposite where there's a hyperactivation. I know that that's how it works, at least in the, at the ear level, um, or the ear brain connection level is that there's no sound signals coming in, but a increased responsiveness to that perceived sound signal. So at the same time, I imagine it would result in kind of maladaptive hyperactivity. And I think the idea of cognitive load applies very similarly. Um, plus tinnitus is itself possibly a uh, symptom of hearing loss. So if people are noticing ringing in their ears, it might actually be just early signs of hearing loss. And in that case, a lot more treatable because tinnitus is a very treatment resistant and kind of hard to find solutions for right now. A lot of up and coming research, very interesting. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for um, sharing um, this hour with us and just really teaching us a lot about hearing loss and dementia. I've learned a lot and I know our audience has as well too. So thank you so much again, Dr. Almond, for um, just helping us learn a lot and also how we can um, help our patients as well too, which I think is really important. And ourselves. Yes, and ourselves <laughs> too, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much everyone for your really great questions too. This has been such a fun discussion. It really has. Yes. Thank you. Everyone have a wonderful day and thank you for tuning in to our lecture series today.